Welcome to Conversations with the Planets with Lori Kaufman and Alicia Sealheiser, a podcast that roots the wisdom of the stars into our lived experiences here on Earth and weaves the power of diverse healing modalities together with astrology. And today we have our friend Lilla Dent on to talk about love cards, Venus, Saturn, and all things related to love and romance and divination. So <laughs> welcome, Lilla. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here. Um, Lori is a super long time friend who um, we just share so many messages every day about all this stuff um, and also a lot of bizarre synchronicities and stuff, which I'm sure will mm -hmm. pop up into the conversation organically. Um, and Alicia, I'm just getting to know you, but it's been so cool to share your insights um, with all of your knowledge as well. And I think the three of us um, have so much combined knowledge of, you know, coming from different places. Um, and it's always just so cool to see how those overlap um, and what kind of sparks a little realization, um, you know, like in a kind of like a domino effect of like understanding or clarity. Um, so really excited to dive into this um, with you guys today. Uh, I think, you know, love, romance, connections, um, relationships, these are some of the most popular topics, right, that people um, come to readers for or that people start to want to dig into their own charts about. Because, um, you know, I mean, relationship and emotional connection is just at the foundation of so much of who we are, right? Uh, no, no man or no person mm -hmm. is an island. Um, and we're all longing for those emotional connections. Um, so getting a better understanding of those is always just so satisfying. And there's also just, oh, there's just so much. Um, yeah, we'll just have to see where this goes today. Um, but yeah, before we get started talking about some of the content we had planned, um, Venus and some Venusian energies and stuff like that, um, I'll just briefly introduce, uh, I guess, myself and a little bit about the modality that I've been focusing on and kind of what I'm bringing to the table today. Um, as Lori knows, and, and both of you know, um, I'm definitely, you know, a little all over the place in terms of the stuff that I love researching. I'm always diving down mm -hmm. some new rabbit hole, you know, buying a book, <laughs> diving into it for a month, um, lots of Gemini placements. So, you know, I love dabbling and putting all these pieces together and really everything is connected and every additional little piece that you get fits in somewhere down the line and that is just so cool. Um, but I have noticed in the last couple of years I've been very specifically drawn to this one modality and that's kind of what I'm bringing to the table today and, and hoping to focus on with you guys. Um, it kind of goes by various names, different names. Um, and, and that's something I'm still kind of trying to figure out of how do I even introduce this succinctly. Um, if you give me 10 minutes to talk about it, I am very good at explaining what I do. But if you give me, you know, one minute or if I have to put it on a business card, sometimes it's hard to explain what it is. Um, it's a system. The system that I'm working with is called um, one of its names. Probably the most common one is the Destiny Cards. Uh, but it's also called uh, the Magi Cards uh, because one of the um, sort of founding institutions that brought it to light um, from its hidden roots in antiquity uh, in the 18th century or 19th century, um, actually in Chicago, which is where I'm right now. Um, don't think that's a coincidence, uh, but they were called the Order of the Magi. So sometimes <laughs> it's called the Magi Cards as well. Um, it's also sometimes called uh, the Love Cards um, because of this book that... Um, Robert Camp, who is kind of the current living expert on this modality, um, he wrote this book and he's one of my mentors. Um, so a lot of people will know it by that name as well. Um, Love Cards, this, this book, this red book is specifically diving into kind of the emotional connections um, and um, what the, this card, card reading system can tell us about our relationships. Um, but it really is so much more than that. Um, it's, it's like astrology, you know, it's like any of these other modalities. If you know what you're looking for, if you know how to extract the information, um, I really think that you can get the answers to just about anything, um, which is, which is so cool. And I'm still learning so much about it. You know, I don't pretend to be an expert by any means. Um, I think I just, I have, you know, six-ish years at this point of knowledge about this modality under my belt. And I feel like I'm just scraping the surface of like feeling competent, you know, to, to talk to people about stuff um, and not be like, is that right? Is that wrong? Um, but obviously there's, there's still so much to be learned. Um, but real quick, just back to, you know, what is the system exactly? Um, 
people always, when I say, you know, I do card readings, they always go, oh, tarot, right, or oracle. Um, and I, I do, do do those as well. Um, but this is separate from those. Um, the destiny card system, well, it does actually have a connection to tarot. So I can explain that briefly because um, there are some really interesting overlaps here between destiny cards and tarot. And people always notice those right away, right? If, you, if you've studied tarot, you'll notice them mm -hmm. right away. Um, but it can actually be very confusing. Um, and that can be perhaps something that we talk about, you know, in, in future episodes as well. Um, sometimes there, there are cards where you go, why is it this thing in this system and this thing, you know, this other thing in the other system? Um, and the reason why is because they're, they're basically like cousins, right? If we were talking about like um, a biological family tree or something, it's like they both have a common distant ancestor. Um, but at this mm -hmm. point, you know, thousands of years have gone by and each one has kind of taken on its own life and its own evolution. Um, but that common ancestor is, you know, this ancient card system that dates back to Egypt. And if you believe in these things, Atlantis, which passed on its knowledge to ancient Egypt, right? There's kind of this um, at least consensus among non-Orthodox historians that ancient Egypt acquired the main bulk of its you know, it's information about um, anything from, you know, science, astronomy, astrology, um, to like, you know, construction techniques, right? Like the pyramids, this is a whole nother rabbit hole. But anyway, they acquired all this stuff from Atlantis, right? So if you believe in that, uh, this card system, the destiny cards is also one of those um, artifacts that was that was handed down or techniques that was handed down. And um, it's, it's the origins of the 52 card playing deck. So when we say cards in the destiny card system, we're talking about the 52 card playing card deck, um, not the tarot deck. Um, and what happened was how tarot was sort of born out of that is you have this ancient divination system, right? That's working with these 52 playing cards. Um, it's being used in, you know, the, the, the magic rituals of the spiritual practices of ancient Egypt and it, the the religious practices at the time were were kind of sequestered right they were secret knowledge they were not as as they are today right there's always this tradition in human society of like secret societies secret cults religion is sort of mm -hmm. the upper echelons of religious knowledge spiritual knowledge are always kind of guarded right the idea is that not everyone's ready for it so you can't just have everyone know about it um, so same thing in Egypt, right? You have a, a priest class that is in charge of using this knowledge and, and passing it on, but it's very closely guarded. Um, but as always, right, nothing is waterproof, nothing is completely leak proof. And um, you had, you know, people who were perhaps um, servants or even, you know, slaves in the Egyptian temples who were sort of overhearing or maybe even actively eavesdropping um, some of this information, right, that the priests were using, um, or even just common citizens maybe who were seeing um, sort of the receiving end of this system of guidance, right, but without really understanding the, the, the deeper roots of it. So you kind of get these pieces of knowledge about this destiny card system trickling out of that temple society in Egypt, um, and it's being carried away later, you know, across the continent, um, by by all kinds of people, you know, um, the descendants of some of these um, like worker classes in Egypt went on to populate, you know, areas that would become, for example, in Europe, like what we think of later as like the the gypsy nations, right? Um, that the traveling um, nations who were were so famous for reading tarot cards, um, and basically they took that destiny card system, you know, what what they understood of it um, from Egypt, and they sort of made it into their own thing they added the major arcana right that's a that's a huge difference between the two um mm -hmm. and also some of the individual qualities of the cards did change a little bit um and there's sort of a little bit of a discrepancy or a little bit of a confusion between the suits um between you know tarot and the destiny cards or the regular playing card deck um so that's kind of um just in a nutshell like where tarot came from um, it's definitely related to this, but it's not this. Um, so usually, you know, for the sake of simplicity and things, we try to keep them um, separate. But that's always something that comes up when people ask me, you know, what is it you do? So I try mm -hmm. to explain that, that there's a, you know, there's a relationship, but also they are separate. Um, but yeah, I think basically that's a, that's a pretty good introduction of it. Um, 
I'll just mention too, um, in terms of how we use the system, right? For example, in uh, astrology, we can generate a natal chart for someone, right? And that's kind of how we begin to examine who they are as a person. Um, and then after we've looked at their natal chart, we can look at, you know, their progress chart, we can look at um, the transit astrology to try and get some more um, context on what's happening in their life right now, what changes are they going through, that kind of thing. And then we can pull a synastry chart, right, which is two people seeing how they connect. And the card system is, is really very similar, um, Destiny cards. Um, you know, we have what we call personality cards, which is kind of like the baseline, the natal chart, if you will. Um, which determines kind of your your life spread. It's um, just what you're born with, what you carry through your entire life. Um, and then we can look at what are called timed spreads, um, which give us an idea of events um, and changing energies um, throughout our life in different time periods. Um, and then we can also do something very similar to synastry, um, which again, doesn't have a good name, like the system sort of is lacking in in, in good names, I think. Um, my mentor specifically said not to use the word synastry for the destiny cards because it's not astrology. Um, so I won't use that word, but I guess you could just say a compatibility reading, um, very similar to a synastry reading in astrology. Um, and it, you know, just looking at the chemistry between two people. Um, so yeah, it has, it has all these diverse applications. Um, and really, you know, it's just about knowing how to use that information, but it is, um, it's just one of my favorite things right now. And I'm just trying to go as far with it as I possibly can. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's a good, maybe a good overview. Um, if there's anything else yeah. that needs to be clarified about that down the line, we can always dive into that, but I don't want to take up too much time just talking about what the system is. So yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we can, I can turn it over to one of you guys to get the conversation started about Venus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Laura, you had been talking about, um, like, we've been reading Alice Sparkly Cat's post-colonial astrology. I read it about mm -hmm. a year or two ago, and Laurie's been working her way through it. And so you'd been talking I about- I just bought a copy. <laughs> oh, it's such Yay! a good book. And we'll put it in the show notes for anyone else, and also a link to an interview on the Astrology Podcast where Ace talks about the book, because also like when you hear their voice and you really see where they're coming from with it, it just adds so much dimension to the book. But um, yeah. yeah. And that's one of my favorite- Yeah, I was just going to say that's one of my favorite astrology books ever and it's really like it's not so much an astrology book rather than like going through each of the planets and telling talking about like the etymology of like how the planets became what they are if that makes sense like um like Those the first energies, chapter is yeah. it's the energies right like the first chapter is the sun and then it talks about the moon and then the sun versus the moon and the whole idea of the Hellenistic astrology principle of fate and for, uh, fate versus fortune, um, mm -hmm. and how like the sun is related to fate and how the moon is related to fortune, and just mm -hmm. and then it just goes on from there, and um, it just it does such a great job of breaking down so many pieces of like how things kind of became the way that they are, and I really was um so I I read the book like a, about a year ago also like I finished it over the summer but I started it like a year ago um it took me a long time to get through it because I kept putting it down and <laughs> needing to process and <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's it was a definitely... thorough dense like it makes you think <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I would I would like read a chapter and then be like, okay, I need three months <laughs> before I pick this back up. Sometimes um, you do need to and... put some time in though. You can't just read something mm -hmm. cover to cover. Like you need to give it time to digest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I probably finished that book in like August or September, but I, I started reading it in like December. Um, it took me a really long time, but um, it was definitely one of those books and I've been thinking a lot, um, especially with like Valentine's Day coming up and um, that Venus energy being so prominent. I've been thinking a lot about the Venus chapter of that book and the story of Inanna and um, talking about her descent into the underworld and um, something that I like 
constantly think about is the tie to the justice card in tarot and how the justice card is Libra and how misunderstood the Libra energy is in general. Um, my best friend is also a Libra, um, Libra sun and Mercury, but uh, Gemini rising. So Libra ruled <laughs> Mercury chart ruler. Um, and she just like all the time will talk about how she doesn't relate to Libra energy, but I see it. I see it mm -hmm. so strongly in her, but what she's not relating to is like the modern astrology take on how Libra is all about balance and love and romance and fun and joy and whatever. And, and it's like, yeah, it, like Libra does have those qualities, of course, and, like, Libra is all about aesthetics and, like, beauty, beauty. and, like, it yeah. is Venus. Like, it is beauty. Um, but it's also deeper than that. It's darker than that. And when I think about Venus, you know, you think about Libra and you think about Taurus and how both of those have that exaltation planet, um, Libra being Saturn and um, Taurus being the moon, <laughs> right? So, like, Taurus just having that, like, extra feminine another like beauty like comfort planet almost whereas like how can venus and saturn cohabitate in libra right like where where does the they depth yeah. come from right like how yeah. yeah how are they friends how are they related yeah. um and understanding the um the story of anana was something that like i think about that story almost every single day and i just remember sitting on my floor like crying as I was reading this book too um because I don't think I realized it was that dark and um I'll put a trigger warning here but basically Anana in her descent in the underworld um and you can correct me if I get any of these pieces wrong because it's been a while um but she basically like long story short gets raped and then comes crawling back to her husband and is like crying and is like all of these things happen to me. Like, will you be there for support? Like, can you hold me? And he basically looks at her and says, well, what did you do to put yourself in that position? Like, why, why were you there? Why did this happen? And he leaves her because of it, because it was her fault that this happened to her. And so the story of Anana has so much to do with revenge and anger and like getting justice in this like really dark way and talking about the balance between like it's like venus's love and joy and all these happy things until you piss it off right like until that saturn energy has to come back and like teach it a lesson right and um i think it was i've been pulling the empress a lot i pull a card of the day i have for years and lila i know you said either yesterday or the day before that yesterday, you pulled yeah. justice yeah, yesterday you pulled Justice and the Empress, and I was like, oh I my god, the, the card of Libra. <laughs> well, and the moon oh god, was also applying it. to a sextile with, with Venus the yesterday too, so to pull like all those Venusian oh, cards, funny. and then the moon is literally applying to Venus, yeah. so that's also... And the Empress was one of my cards yesterday too, I've pulled it the past like three days, and when you sent me a picture of your cards yesterday morning... I instantly like saw those two cards together and I was like, oh my God, the card of Libra, the card of Venus. I now have to talk about Inanna for 20 minutes. And I left you yeah. one of my famous podcast <laughs> voice messages. Um, but it just like really triggered this whole like passion of like, why is this so misunderstood? Why isn't this like talked about because that is a huge part of the Libra side of Venus it's almost like Taurus is like here to appreciate the beauty and Taurus energy of course too like I mean Taurus rules the throat it rules food it rules like um almost like overindulgence at its most mm -hmm. negative or like um becoming too stagnant because you're so comfortable or like laziness at its stagnancy like Taurus definitely has negative qualities don't get me wrong like I'm not saying it doesn't but like the negative qualities of Libra just feel so much 
not negative, I guess, but like the, the harder, more difficult qualities of Libra just feel so much darker than that Taurus energy. And I think that really is just the difference of the exalted moon versus the exalted um, Saturn. Yeah, that's so interesting. And um, yeah, I mean, I am a Libra rising <laughs> and my Venus is conjunct Pluto in Scorpio. So yeah. I definitely know more about know. the less like societally <laughs> prioritized manifestations of Venusian energy, if you will. And it's just so interesting because there's there's different versions of the myth of Inanna, which for those who haven't heard sure. of it is the ancient Mesopotamian myth for Inanna was their goddess of love and who they associated with the planet Venus. And, you know, one of the places where the like association with balance comes in for Libra and for Venus mm -hmm. in particular is that Venus has an incredibly symmetrical synodic cycle and mm -hmm. you know if you look at the way that Venus maps through the sky and her entire synodic yeah. cycle it makes this beautiful succulent sacred mm -hmm. geometry rose shape mm -hmm. and yeah. you know it's Venus where the, spends... the star shape came from yeah and mm -hmm. Venus spends half of her time as a morning star where you can see the planet visible mm -hmm. in the morning before the sunrise and half of their time as an evening star visible in the evening and then famously has a 40 day and night um, period where they're invisible because they're so close to the sun and that is what the Mesopotamians yeah. associated with Inanna's descent into the underworld there's a lot of really good resources out there about the myth but the yeah. association of vengeance right because another one that um is part of the myth is Inanna coming back after you know visiting her sister in the underworld and being killed and hung on a meat hook and you know having horrible things done to her she comes back to find that her husband or lover has taken her throne just like the barbie movie and then she has to fight mm. to get her throne back okay. and yeah. so that you know the association of like justice of vengeance of needing to fight to protect what matters to you like venus as a star or a planet yeah. in the sky has been associated with love and also as a warrior goddess throughout time and space and with many different peoples yeah. right and like i mean love and war go together right but there's this yeah. also this need to protect what you love and protect what matters to you um yeah. and yeah, I just really think that especially in modern life with misogyny and we really try to take away feminine power and the power yeah. of like female and feminine and like just more yeah. like the softer energy, which we all hold in us. And so then we just want to think of Venus as the lover and have her be like complacent and calm and easy to work with. But you like can't separate love from fighting for what you care about as well. Right. What it makes me and think of the I lover's just card add... too, right? Like in the tarot, yeah. that's one of Lori's favorite things is that like, you know, the lover's card is not just about love and Valentine's Day. It's like about choices, right? Again, that duality. Mm. Yeah, it's choosing. And um, just to add, I have a few things to say. Um, but for one, just to add like a few little like, I guess, fun facts about Venus as well. Um, it only gets away from the sun. Um with 48 degrees so it can only mathematically be one or two signs away from the sun at any point so mathematically like if your sun is in um my son's in aquarius i could only possibly have venus in one or in two signs above and two signs below and um because it makes that star shape it only retrogrades in five different signs and it takes about eight years for it to retrograde in those certain signs again. So leaning into back um, back to what you were saying about the Barbie movie, um, one of my favorite like fun facts that kind of came out of that were the ties between the Barbie movie and the Venus retrograde in Leo particularly, Literally. which is such – yeah, it was so crazy. Um, that which Leo the astrology energy, like, podcast the has child. talked about – so much so we'll yes. link that down below as well because they've done so much amazing research on venus and yeah Leo so and much Barbie. research like, yeah and it's so tied together i mean like what was it like greta gerwig and um ruth the woman who invented barbie and the barbie movie and the release date of barbie like 
the mm. actual doll itself like all came out or like um or were born or whatever on the day that venus station retrograde in leo in mm. all different oh. years Mm -hmm. which is like happens every eight years and so it's so crazy because like the barbie movie was literally released the day of the station and um yeah the the astrology podcast has an amazing episode talking about that i was so amazed <laughs> um by how much they found and how many charts they had to pull to get all that research um but yeah it's really cool to see the the ties of how like Uh oh, that Libra energy. I think we just lost you, but you came back. I heard something about ties and then Libra energy. So I think we've gotten oh, most weird. of what you said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying that like all of the ties between like the Libra energy, the Venus energy, the Leo energy, like just mm. all of those things kind of coming together were just um very much explained in the movie too like it all just kind of came full circle I felt like a hundred percent did a really good job of showing the negative sides or the difficult sides of Venus um and not just the quieted like Barbie like in <laughs> the feminine <laughs> Right. Well, and it's like, I know, Lori, one of the facts you have about rising signs too, right? Was it like all Victoria's secret models are like Libra risings or something? Like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, yeah. I watched a podcast once and they said that like 95% of the Victoria's secret models that they interviewed were all Libra or Virgo risings. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and like Britney <laughs> Spears, Beyonce, like there's a lot of Libra risings out there who, I mean, Beyonce is Libra incarnate. She, she has Saturn mm -hmm. and Venus and mercury and jupiter all in her libra first house so mm. what's yeah. her birthday there's a lot of scorpio She's a virgo sun do you know what her birthday is i was gonna look her up i don't know birthday. just virgo season <laughs> let me i'll look it up i'm curious now. you should yeah google it because i was trying to see what um in the card system what number was associated with taurus and i couldn't find it um because sixes oh, are associated with Libra, which is um, mm -hmm. which is something that you know I was going to talk about when you guys were were done with your piece. Um, but I was trying to think what number was associated with Taurus, and I just couldn't. Um, again, pieces that I need to figure out. Um, Beyonce is September fourth, which makes her a seven of diamonds. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see what her other card is. Diamonds are typically work cards too, right? Um, like hard workers. Those are more, I think you're thinking spades. Um, and that might oh, be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's the diamonds and the spades are kind of a little confusing sometimes because um, like I think maybe with the tarot too, like wands and pentacles mm -hmm. get really confusing. I feel like cups are very clearly hearts, right? There's no dispute there. Um, right. But like the, I guess the other three, honestly, like swords, wands, pentacles get kind of confused, which is which, because it's like the diamonds have the implications of, I mean, they're values. It's it's wealth, but like on a more expansive level, okay. it's just values. It's what do you value? Um, mm. And spades is, spades is an interesting one um, because they are um, multiple qualities. Um, perhaps because they are the oldest suit, right? So the suits have an age mm -hmm. hierarchy. Um, it goes hearts, clubs, diamonds, spades. And the spades as the oldest suit, they kind of encapsulate a little bit of everything. Um, and I guess you could say like, it's almost like in the, in the Zodiac, it would be like, it's like a Pisces energy where they're like, you know, about to end that cycle. They're kind of heading out the door and they're coming back, ready to come back around. Yeah. Um, so there's- Spiritual. Yeah. Right. There's definitely like a really heavy spiritual element, but there's also spades or work, which is very 3D, very mm -hmm. mundane, very physical. It's the body. So there's almost an internal mm -hmm. contradiction with spades where it's like it's it's and you see that in spades people, people who have a lot of spades cards. Um, they're very drawn to like just work um, and, and, and often like physical things. But there's also this inner pull to spirituality. And sometimes that can be a conflict. Mm -hmm. um, 
and sometimes like their their challenges about rising out of the physical getting out of this like work mindset and actually tapping into that spiritual quality um yeah what we were saying beyonce's second card though let me just see seven of diamonds um and she's a five of spades um interesting yeah i don't because unfortunately mm -hmm. i don't remember which number was associated with taurus um i mean neither of those are because you were saying she's like libra incarnate right um neither of those are necessarily in the card system they're not necessarily like a libra number or quality um but when i think about everything that you're saying about you know the nuance of venusian energy of libra um, that there's like this this other side to it. I mean, I think that you start to see more with that five and a seven um, just because they're both, I mean, those are both like, I don't know, sassy isn't maybe the right word, but just like they're very, they're, those are not like docile cards, right? Like that's not gonna be a docile person. Um, seven of diamonds people in general just are like a little bit different. I feel like they just kind of have their own agenda or whatever you want to say um their own yeah. worldview and they just kind of do things in a certain way and um they will they will kind of just yeah have their own way of doing it and to other people it'll kind of be like whoa what you know why are you doing it that way or like that's really crazy um but it works for them um and mm -hmm. yeah she's actually she, that's actually probably a great example of, of someone who's just kind of making it work for themselves um yeah even though it, it may seem really different for other people um, there's also a strong tie seven of diamonds card um some people are able to tap into that better than others but there's um a strong potential for making a lot of money there um so some some very rich people have that card um and and lots of people have that card who have not tapped into it but um there's always the potential to make a lot of money so that's an interesting one yeah hmm. Let me just, I'm going to ask Michael and see if he can mute his notifications because I think that's his computer making those noises. <laughs> but you can, you can continue. Well, while I yeah. Another thing I think <laughs> is interesting to kind of dif differentiate between Libra and Taurus is even just the basic of like air versus earth, right? That Libra is the air sign manifestation sure. of Venus's energy and Taurus is the earth sign. And so that's why, mm -hmm. you know, when Lori was talking earlier about Taurus being so focused on these like very material things and even maybe being slow or stubborn or lazy because it's like Taurus is the earth, Taurus is the plants, is the food, is, you know, all of right. the things that allow us to be here. Because Venus from an ancient orphic orientation venus is everything like love infuses all and like the world right. is enmeshed and enter what like interwoven with love going through everything and then um you know you get that and you manifest that through the earth and that's taurus and so then it's like how does the love flow through the earth to nourish and support us in life whereas yeah. libra is a lot more of the air and is a lot faster moving is a lot more focused on connection um a lot of libras i know are smart as hell as well which you know think about that with gemini and aquarius but libra yeah. is also an air sign and you know there's different types of intelligence and as someone with a lot of air sign energy i can recognize that just because you're mentally intelligent does not mean you have you know body intelligence or emotional intelligence and you know there's so many different ways to be smart but like air signs do love to just hold information and share information and learn and analyze and um yeah I think that's something that people don't think about with Libra as much and then you know air sign energy can just be really hard to hold sometimes when you're overthinking and especially in this enlightenment right. area where we're taught to live in our heads and we can kind of trick ourselves right. away from like what the earth and our bodies and our emotions are calling for when we're in our heads and yeah. I think that can be a downside of Libra energy when someone's too intellectual or too fair or you know I can see both sides of things and then you know it's like well one side has grossly way more power than the other side and you're not acknowledging that or mm -hmm. you know you're just not having an emotional reaction you're just being analytical but I think it is important to really think about the different ways that Venus energy yeah. comes through the elements and yeah, I well, think I too <laughs> sorry just to add oh, real quick yeah. Libra um I feel like gets the um interpretation of like being an airhead all the time mm -hmm. like that's something I hear and it's like well 
I feel like Libra is just not talking when they don't have an opinion, like very similar to like Aquarius energy, where it's like, you know, an Aquarius is never wrong, but the Aquarius is never wrong because they're only going to speak up if they've done the research. And I feel like Libra is pretty similar to that, where it's like, it's going to kind of just not care if it doesn't care. Um, but also with the elements, I think adding the modalities into it has a big piece of this too because like mm -hmm. when I think about the fixed signs in general like I think about fixed signs as like like if you're gonna put them in a box what are they doing right so like fixed earth which is Taurus never moving again right that's a rock yeah. <laughs> like that is a that is a block of dirt <laughs> in a box forever and so you know Taurus energy is gonna kind of just like make a decision and stick with it or they're gonna just like they're going to do things that are more set in their ways, whereas Libra is a cardinal sign, and cardinal signs are the movers and the shakers and the the beginnings and the ideas and um, moving towards something. And so cardinal signs in general, they start the seasons. They are the ones that, like, come up with the Oh, no. As well. Oh, my God. I lost her again. We lost you for like five You're seconds, back. though. You were just saying that Libra is really? cardinal, so it initiates things. And so I, I'm assuming like Libra initiates social connection. And so I always think of that with the Venus in the air. But yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know why my internet's, there's no reason it should be cutting out. Um, <laughs> but it's probably yeah, me. I mean, I mean, honestly, I really have such an effect on technology. Like people think I'm joking until <laughs> this sort of stuff happens. And I'm like, yeah, this is probably me. Like. So sorry. That's so funny. It's funny. This is our eleventh episode, and we um haven't had any technology issues, so we were due for something. I, I bet you it will not come back next time either. Like it's probably literally <laughs> just me. Um, I wanted to That's add real so quick. Funny. If you were done with your, were you done with your comment, Lori? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to add before I forgot, um, just about the idea of Libras being um, smart um, and then also, um, but also the the stereotype of like being airheads. Um, I think there's mm -hmm. something in the card system there which speaks to both of those things, which is just that um, Libra is considered like the, the Libra number is considered six and it's also the Saturn number, which we can go into later. Um, but it's, um, it's sixes are among other things, they are considered divine channels for information um, mm -hmm. because they're so tapped into the balance of things in the world, right? Like if you're a six, you have a sort of a, a tap into um, just like the fundamental, almost like universal truth, right? About like, is this in balance or not? Um, is this mm -hmm. fair or is it not? Um, so they do have this strong sense of justice. Um, and they're so sensitive to that, right? Because they can't turn that off. Other people can be sensitive to balance and truth and justice too, but it's either more of a learned thing or it's more of, um, I guess you could say like an optional thing, right? Like they can turn it on or off. Mm -hmm. um, but sixes really can't. And so I find that, well, well, one immediate side effect of that is that, you know, sixes are psychic, right? So like, I love getting a six in a reading because, um, especially the women I found, right? Men, I think, have more difficulty accessing that side of themselves. I think that's probably just a, a cultural thing in, in my estimation, um, but, but, or just something about, you know, fundamental energies of how do, you know, men and women tap into these things like spiritual qualities and things. I think women tend to just be a little bit more um, in tune with their intuitive side, right? So typically women who are sixes, um, you know, if I mention sort of the idea of, of them having psychic qualities, usually the response I get is a huge eye roll and like, a, oh girl, I know, tell me about it. Like this has been going on my whole life, you know. Um, if I tell that to a man who's a six, they usually just kind of give me a weird skeptical look, right? And they're like, what? Um, but anyway, point being that, you know, sixes typically are, are very psychic. And um, what does it mean to be psychic, really? Well, it's just it's access to information that the rest of us don't necessarily have, right? And it's seen as weird or spooky or whatever. And sometimes psychic, you know, input um, can't be trusted because it can't be validated by other people or other, you know, like machines. Um, but really what it just comes down to is you have access to 
information about reality that other people don't, um, i.e. you're a channel, right? So I think there's definitely something there about, um, you know, six energy, Libra energy just being, it's, I don't even know if smart is the right word. Like I think in the, in the card system, right, in terms of numbers, twos are the smart card. Um, they're like the, the mental card. Um, well, twos and threes are both mental, but twos are just like the very smart card. Um, it's just like the mind is so strong. The mind is so active. Um, but sixes are like, it's like a subconscious, right? It's not even something they control. It's not like, it's not like they're thinking about it. And I think they're not necessarily putting it to good use either. Not necessarily, right? And sometimes, especially if it's coming through in like a psychic way, they're scared by it, right? I've met a lot of sixes who are like, oh yeah, I've had that stuff happen, but I try to block it out, right? I don't like what happens when I let that come in or people say I'm mm -hmm. crazy or, you know, all kinds of things. So whether it's twos mm -hmm. are usually very proud of their mental abilities, right? You tell a two, oh, you're a mental card. You're very smart. They go, oh, I know. Yeah. You know, they have a big smile on their face um, because two mental energy, I think in this system is much more recognized, encouraged, applauded by like our society, right? Whether mm -hmm. six mental energy is not, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. you're oversensitive, you're crazy, you know, you're something's off, right? And, you know, we do we do see that too. I think we even had a mutual acquaintance where we were talking about that and they had a six card and we were saying, you know, like it's it's very clear that they're like tapped into this stuff, but it's like it's also maybe manifesting as like mental illness, right? Or schizophrenia or bipolar or something like that, because it's almost like too the wires are crossing or you know, there's too, too much, much avoiding. Yeah. yeah, avoiding or just fear or or just energy flowing through the system and it's mm -hmm. not being regulated well. Um, and you, sure. you don't see that with twos, you know, you see that with sixes. Um, so I think, yeah, there's definitely something in there about um, it's like mental or yeah, it's not there's not a good word for it, but it's like this this knowledge that sixes or maybe Libra energy has intuition. Right like what it sounds like, like. Mm -hmm. body body knowledge almost um as opposed to just like brain mm -hmm. knowledge um yeah. and i think um there's a bit of a tie in there too with this idea that they might be um bimbos right or air airheads or something because i think there's different reactions to having that kind of quality and one of them is to completely downplay it to reject it right be like oh that's not me and just be like oh i'm just so simple and you know like this is not me like um, so that could come off that way. Um, or um, the other thing that happens, I think, with sixes a lot is that they're very sensitive, right? And if they're not taught mm -hmm. ways to handle, like, the triggers that they get and all this sometimes excess information that could very well be scary too, right? Ghosts or who knows what, right? Mediumship type of messages. Um, if they're not taught how to handle that well, um, they just become overly sensitive and they can become very snappy, very bitchy, very whiny, very confrontational, even like very aggressive, right? And so you can you can kind of get these these really like negative qualities coming out as a result of that. So I think well, that might yeah. be yeah, that might be a tie in. Yeah. And that now that you're saying all of this, what it really makes me think of is that Libra represents social intelligence right because it's the mm, air sign intelligence and then it's the venus yeah. socialness and then that experience like as a libra i and as someone with a lot of pisces as well like i'm always so sensitive and tuned to the energies of everyone else around me and mm. i really want to be like participating and contributing contributing in a way that keeps those energies like flowing together nicely and then sometimes that works better and worse for me because my venus is like not in the best yeah. condition um and that's you know where like venus being non-traditional is more like less of a people pleaser right whereas like a venus in pisces or venus in taurus or libra might be super super concerned about what everyone else needs and so then you might sometimes even put your own needs like not as for, far forward, whereas like a Venus and Scorpio or Aries might sure. not have as much like social connection, but they're going to meet their needs a little more. But regardless, as a Libra, like people with a lot of Libra or Venus energy are going to feel really tuned into the energies of other people. And I feel like, Lila, everything you just said was a really beautiful description of the different ways that it is to like, like that intuitive, like 
yeah. almost psychic connection of how are other people feeling? How is this energy flowing around us? And then also the ways that culturally, you know, we're in, especially like we all live in the United States. It's a very individualistic culture. You know, you're not supposed to be thinking about collaboration and others and how other people feel. And so it yeah. can be, especially in the more distorted versions of it, get really, really uncomfortable like Lola was talking about. Well, and I have- Yeah, a- and I would love to- oh. Go ahead. <laughs> well, oh, I, I just want to say I, I would love to add to that that like I love to think about each sign as like how they interact with their opposite sign. Mm-hmm. And uh, what you're basically describing about Libra, like Libra is the opposite of Aries. And Aries is like your sense of self. And so I love to think of like Aries as being the exaltation of the sun, the ego which is, of course, uncomfortable in a sign like Libra, which is other people, right? Like similar to Aquarius, again, where it's like Libra is more like the partner energy, like partnerships, like let's find peace and balance between relationships because Libra is such a relationship-based sign. It's an air sign, whereas Aries is a sign of the self and like it's a it's a more like selfish energy um and not in a bad way um but this I think about this opposition a lot I have an Aries moon my chart ruler but my uh Jupiter is in Libra um and they're not quite opposite each other by um by degree they're 11 degrees apart but by sign they are um, and I was saying something to you, Lila, the other day in a voice message, but I was talking about the difference between um, Venus and Mars. And that's something that like she was talking about a lot in the uh, po- uh, in the post-colonial astrology book. Um, that's something that Alice speaks about ace a couple times. They. Um, ace. They. No, yeah. Not, not sure. Um, okay. Yeah. They talk about um there's a chapter that is um like venus and mars together and that chapter really made me think a lot about how both of them kind of have that like war and fighting type of energy in them um but it felt like i forget what exactly i said to you the other day but i was just saying that like what you said was feels that- more You said they can both be aggressive, right? (laughs) They can both attack, but Mars doesn't always have a reason. Venus always does. Yeah. Yeah. Like Venus. That really hit home. Because I think as a woman, like sometimes you just feel so cornered and so like attacked. You're like, fuck, I have to draw deep into this part of me that's like a wild animal and actually fight back, you know? Um, But Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm ever going out of my way to just be like, Hey, little creature down there, Aggressive. you want to fight? Yeah, like, you know, I, that's that's not yeah. me. That's never me. I never want to. And I mean, this actually ties perfectly into what I was going to say, too. Um, that's mm-hmm. another quality of the sixes is that they are peace loving individuals, right? On on a basic mm-hmm. level, because they sense balance and they crave balance right. more than anyone else. Um, well, twos also crave balance, but six is, it's more of like a, a universal, like energetic balance, not just like balance within sure. a partnership. Um, but because again, they're so sensitive and they sense these things, um, when it's disrupted, right, they actually become very confrontational, very aggressive. They will fight with you to to write the balance, right? So the joke is kind of like, don't pick mm-hmm. a fight with a six because you'll lose, Right. A lot of competitive athletes have a six as one of their cards because it gives them that extra kind of pushing force where they're like, I'm going to meet you. It's like that equal and opposite force thing. I'm going to meet you exactly where you come at me. So if you come at me really hard and strong, I'm not going to let you budge. Um, But also like they're not probably going to take that first step. Um, And I was going to ask you, you know, um, because in the card system, it's like the sixes are almost seen as like the... um, enforcers or like the regulators of the system um because they have Mm. the sense of balance and what's right right that other cards don't they are uniquely um like authorized like they have this you know genuine like divine ability to um to sort of dictate hey you need to step back or hey this is too much dial this down or you know like this wasn't fair let's fix it 
right? Um, mm -hmm. And I was going to ask you if there's sort of some kind of connotation with with Libra energy with that of like, like stepping like again Venus only aggresses mm -hmm. when there's a reason like of kind of like actually coming right. in well and, yeah well um another thing like kind of as you were saying that like another difference I guess between Libra and Taurus is that Libra is a masculine sign and Taurus is a feminine sign so there is like another difference there um but I also think about this occasionally too and I don't know what it quite means but when you split the signs in half Libra is kind of when it first starts over so like if Aries is the first sign they all are like you know you start going down the lines until you hit Virgo Libra is the first time that it's like an opposite reaction to the sign that you already said basically and so Libra almost feels like you know it's the start of the fall it's the start of like the second half of the signs almost like the second half of the zodiacal year like there always has been some sort of like reset or restart quality to Libra energy quality yeah like a quality um in like my personal interpretation to it at least but that's something I've thought about quite a bit is just how like Libra kind of starts the second half of the the signs and so mm -hmm. like well what does that mean to it you know like how does that add any bit of interpretation to Libra energy in general yeah well it's like the restorer of peace it's the it's the restorer of balance right and it's like we liked it's so much simpler just to think of the end result which is peace and balance and beauty but it's like actually on the path yeah. to restoring those things there can be some bloodshed right, right? there can be some serious conflict and well, it's like and that makes all of the beginning of... signs moving on, on too like all the younger signs in then libra's like when you start getting into the older signs that kind of focus on more almost spiritual like serious qualities or like more like well, it's a bit more it's like spiritual. I'm an adult yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the card system, six is right before seven, and sevens are considered the bridge number. That's mm -hmm. the first of the spiritual numbers. So it's like once you've oh, graduated from being a six, you go into your spiritual numbers. Um, mm -hmm. and you're well, like, and Lilla, so occupied. Yeah. Yeah. Like Lilla, what you were talking too about peace and like the restoration of peace makes me think too of like how common it is when you go to protests to hear people chanting no justice no peace and that's mm -hmm. like honestly mm -hmm. the most libra thing and the bell hooks quote of mm -hmm. i always like put the words in the wrong order but it's like without just without love there can be no justice or without justice there can be no love yeah. and the ways that mm -hmm. those are intertwined together and then when we also look at like the, the ways that harms can be hot caused and a lot of very mars like harms and destruction on people and war and just violence and those sorts of things you can't just brush over it and be like oh it's okay like you were traumatized or you were harmed and we're just gonna not take accountability for that and mm -hmm. move on like you can't heal from that you need to actually have like transformative justice you need to have like retribution and accountability and things to actually restore like harm that has been caused from that mars angle and like that's kind of the teeth to libra right is that you can't just sure. like roll over and give your belly and be like okay i submit no it's like you you need accountability and you need justice to actually have love um what makes me think of i had i had two thoughts here i'll try not to lose them but um i might be slightly misquoting this but i found this amazing quote somewhere and i don't remember who said it but it was basically about the definition of justice right because it's so difficult to define what justice is and this was just such a different perspective i was like wow that's beautiful it was basically saying compassion is love expressed in a private sphere right justice is love expressed in a public sphere and I was like, it took me a second to like sink in what that means, right? Because usually love and justice yeah. were like, those are different things. Like those don't really have anything. Like when we think yeah. of love, we don't think of enforcing justice, right? We don't think of like right. having to do things that are brutal and scary. Um, but it's like, no, that's what love is, is like standing up and being like, this isn't right. Or like, you know, yeah. even starting a conflict because you're like, no, this this goes against my idea of love, right? So I just, I love that quote. Um, and then the other thing I was gonna say was, it's interesting because I feel like there's this common theme of like, 
Venus only acts like demonstrates this sort of scary or even perceived as negative, um, aggressive qualities, um, confrontational when she's pushed there, right? Because like that's the definition of the scale, right? right. It'll stay floating peacefully until you push it and then it has to spring back right but mars always kind of has this choice mars can just march around and be like i'm gonna start a fight i'm gonna do this i'm gonna you right it's just sort of like a much mm -hmm. more um there's there it seems yeah. like there's more choice involved and responsibility in that sense and it's interesting because right. in the card system you know mars connections when we're looking at like the sinistry compatibility between people um mars connections um are kind of an interesting one because a lot of the connections are very clear whether they're like negative or positive um, or just kind of neutral um mars connections can kind of go in both directions and the joke with the mars connection mm -hmm. is like if you have a lot of mars energy with someone you're either going to want to fight them fuck them or do exercise with them right something really active that involves the body um and two out of those three things are good, right? Or, or not negative, but fighting is not good, right? And unfortunately, a lot of people with a lot of Mars connections, the fight energy ends up coming out. Um, and one thing that was brought up in a class at some point was that um, maybe more so than those other connections, when you have a Mars connection, there's a choice involved. So like, let's say, you know, um, let's say Alicia is like three times my Mars or something like she's got a lot of Mars energy from me, right? It's always a directional thing. I mean, it could be mutual too, but let's say it's particularly difficult when it's like one person is that Mars energy for the other person. So let's say like, you know, Alicia has a lot of Mars energy and I'm like, oh, like I'm feeling this, this heat, right? And it's like Mars wants to act but he has to make the right choice or he has to make a good choice. Otherwise it's going to be just violence for no reason. Right? So what they were saying in the class was basically that the person who is on the receiving end of that. So in my case, me, right. Has the choice actually to sort of mentally just think about it and be like, Oh, this is Mars acting up. I choose not to channel it into fighting. I'm gonna, you know, exercise with Alicia instead or do something that moves our bodies, right? And and channels that more productively. And I've never really heard that said about the other connections. I feel like the other connections, they just kind mm -hmm. of are. You don't have as much of a choice. Um, and certainly like Venus connections just are are lovely things, you know, in this system. There's not really a downside to them. Uh, but Mars, it's interesting because there really is that choice of like, do I want to be, you know, really aggressive and nasty or do I want to find a better avenue for this energy? Yeah. And I feel like that almost that just feels like quintessential like teenage boy energy, you know, like there's nothing wrong with having right. that energy, right? Like it's a beautiful thing to have that much energy. But like I feel like, right. you know, teenage boys often they just don't know what to do with it, right? Like they don't know how to channel it and then it gets channeled into the wrong places. Um so yeah, that well, that's just kind of what that made me think of. Yeah, and that feels really like prominent too into like why Mars is in detriment in Libra. Like why, you know, Mars's least favorite place to be is Libra <laughs> because it does turn yeah. you into a little bit indecisive and um maybe passive aggressive at points or maybe just mm. like, you know, like Mars in Libra like doesn't know how to use its or channel its um mars energy and i it almost feels like it's because you know libra doesn't want to fight unless it's forced to, to yeah. fight yeah. has to and then even then it wants to fight in a saturn way not a mars way right and so it's like that just feels so powerful like the detriment of mars like of course it doesn't want to fight yeah. For no reason. It wants to fight for a cause. And going into the the whole justice thing too, real quick. Um, I teach tarot school. And every time I do the majors and the minors, and um, when I get to the justice card, I get so many questions. And mm -hmm. without fail, every single time I've ever had tarot school, I have had at least one to three people say, I don't get the justice card or I don't like the justice card or my least favorite card is the justice card. And um, the past two times I had tarot school, I actually created like an actual like workbook to go along with it. And um, I gave like homework between each class and I did the first class on um, like the astrology you need to know to understand tarot and the connections between the two. 
And after that class, going into the first class on the majors, I always ask, like, okay, what's your least favorite card? Like, you know, most people come into tarot school, like, at least knowing something. So I always love to ask those questions before we get into what any of the cards actually even are, um, so that I can just hear almost like the skill level of everyone in the class, too. Mm -hmm. Like, it teaches me a lot about where everyone is, but always justice is always like the one card <laughs> that I never don't hear and I, I get judgment a lot too I think those two I was say, um, mine is you know, judgment Pluto. I would say judgment, I would say judgment. yeah <laughs> yeah that one's confusing yeah. judgment too. judgment is definitely the the secondary question card that like obviously no one understands that one either um and that's Pluto I mean that makes sense mm. but it just is always so interesting to me how misunderstood justice is. And it really wasn't until I read Ace's book that I really was like, oh, like I understood justice, but now I get it. Like now it like really hit home that justice is only going to fight once it's messed with. Justice isn't going to fight and I've seen the justice card like just from doing readings for so many years now like it does tend to be like legal issues or things like that um and I've, I've seen it so often be like especially when justice is reversed like yeah. somebody's in a yeah like a custody battle or like fighting um like they're they have to go to court for something like it's always 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 that comes up that way well so. guys can i interject a very personal comment about the justice card of course your your story just like gave me this huge chill because i was thinking about it and i was like what's the most notable time that i pulled the justice card as my card of the day yeah it was the morning of my wedding right and Lori was there um but this was like six right. months ago in july and you know i was so nervous that morning for my card of the day because i was like what's my fucking card of the day gonna be you know and I guess I was just expecting anything but justice. And I was like, it wasn't that I was like, this is a bad card. I was just like, what does this mean? Right? Like what a weird yeah, card yeah. to pull on the day of the wedding. And I mean, you know, Lori was there. I think she can attest to this, but it was it was such a beautiful day. It was such a beautiful ceremony. Like everything went above and beyond what we were like hoping for. Like everything just turned out so well. And now I'm just thinking about it. I had this huge chill because like, so my husband, right? He He's a four five and a six. He's a six of diamonds um, and not to get like too off track here, but six of diamonds is my karma cousin. So what that means is in this system, card system, um, we have karma relationships where people are sort of destined to give something or teach us something in this lifetime because basically we helped them in a previous lifetime. Now they're supposed to be helping us. So Michael's my karma cousin, his six of diamonds specifically is my karma cousin to my nine of clubs, which is a card which is all about relationships and romance. Nine of clubs is like the dark romance card. Two of hearts is like the light mm -hmm. romance. Nine of clubs is like dark, like people who had issues with romance in a past life. They were overly fixated on it. They're here to understand like the limitations of romance almost, right? So his six of diamonds, which is all about balance and justice and fairness in values. And I mean, let me tell you, Michael is like, he's a quintessential six in that sense. Like he is such mm -hmm. a sweet, peace loving, compassionate guy, but people get really weirded out because he will switch on a dime as soon as he senses that something is unjust. Right. And I mean, granted, sometimes his radar's off, right? Sometimes he overreacts, that kind of thing. But like, generally speaking, he's very attuned and he's picked up on things that I have not picked up on, right? Like he's just had spidey senses or whatever about like this person is like off or like something is wrong here. And he will just flip on a dime and just become so aggressive, like really scary. Like it, it freaks me out, you know? And that's been something in our relationship that we've been like really working on um, is this idea of like, yeah, like of, of sort of only pushing back when you're pushed. And the problem with a six, or I shouldn't say problem, but one of the challenges if you're not a six and you're with a six is the harder you push on them, the harder they push back on you, right? So he'll kind of like trigger me sometimes and, you know, I will lash out at him and then he'll just be pushing back and I'm like, you're fighting me. And he's like, no, you fought me first, you know? And there's kind of this, there's, I, I mean, there's, there's so much to this. I can't really explain it all in, in a couple sentences, but I was just like, wow, that's so interesting that I pulled that card because I feel like there's this huge theme for him and me 
about like, yeah, what does, what does justice mean? What does balance mean? What yeah. does justified violence look like? What does justified conflict look like? Right. And when is it just yeah. picking fight? When is it just Mars acting out? Um, so I was yeah. like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, the wedding too, I mean, like it's signing a contract, you know, yeah, and yeah, I think that's a big thing. Um, not that the signs in the houses are associated, but like the seventh house is like your partner and like those important relationships in your life, but also contracts. And it's mm. also like signing legal documents and stuff can be, it can be seventh and eighth house a little bit too. And like, that's something I feel like I remember having that conversation with you that morning when you were like, why did I pull this card? And I was like, because you're signing a contract. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, and that might just be a good segue too into talking more about the intersections of Venus and Saturn and why is mm. Saturn exalted yeah. mm -hmm. in Libra. And Lilla, you had mentioned that the sixes are associated with Saturn, which I would like to hear more about. Um, yeah. Yeah, like love and contracts. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely, yeah. this is one of my favorite topics yeah. with sixes. I think, honestly, like in this card system, right, like everyone kind of has personal favorites or like cards that they just are fascinated by. And maybe it's because I'm married to a six, right? And incidentally, there's a very strong, that six of diamonds, nine of clubs pairing, um, that's a very, like a lot of people end up in that coupling, mm -hmm. which I think is so funny because um, I'm not a nine of clubs. I'm a queen of hearts, but that's like my, that's my karma card. So you could say it's a, it's a shade of myself, right? It's not me, but it's so close to me. It might as well be me. So I just thought that was so funny, sure. but sixes are like one of my favorite numbers to talk about because I feel like they just have so much in them and they're so deeply linked. They're not on the surface of it, they're not a spiritual number. They're not a seven or a nine, um, but they um, but they have this deep link to like all this spiritual stuff. So it's one of my favorite numbers to talk about. Um, but all that to say, um, yeah. So the, the the link between six and Saturn in the card system, um, it just has to do with the fact that um, six is the number of karma, right? And Saturn is the lord of karma, and. I always kind of have to, I, I try to give people, like when I do readings, I try to give people a little 20 second sort of disclosure about karma because I do think that we have kind of a, sometimes a skewed perception of karma, right? In in our current like modern day life, like that's become such a buzzword, right? And kind of like this whole like karma is a bitch. Oh, that's that karma is gonna come around for you. Like phrases like that, right? Like. They're, it's not that they're wrong, but I think people, it's natural, right? We, we are very subjective, mm -hmm. emotionally centered people, creatures who see reality through the filter of our own experience. Um, it's very difficult to be objective and karma is objective, right? It's not subjective. But as soon as you start perceiving it subjectively, mm -hmm. which is by definition how we perceive everything, um, we start mm -hmm. to think of things in terms of like revenge, right? Um, and, and even like justice, mm -hmm. right? That is on some level, there's kind of a, there's an objective way to see justice, but there's also a very subjective way to see justice. Um, and it's not even necessarily wrong to see it subjectively, but I think if we get too caught up in that subjective sense, right, we miss the bigger picture, which is just that Saturn karma, right? It's just about providing the user. Um, if we're thinking about like, you know, avatar theory or whatever, um, the, 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 the gamer. Um, I really love the idea that we're just, we're playing a game, you know, we're plugged in somewhere and we've, we've downloaded like our, you know, our little avatar mm -hmm. and we've picked our skin and our stats and we're playing a game. Um, but anyway, karma <laughs> is just there to provide the user with the complete experience. Um, and this is one of the facts that I think is so cool, right? Saturn is the sixth planet. Um, Lori and I were just talking about this yesterday, but it's the last visible planet, right? So the ancients thought that the planets ended with Saturn. Saturn was kind of the, the ancient Pluto, right? It was sort of the, the death and the dark planet. Um, and later they discovered, right, there's stuff beyond, there's Uranus, there's Neptune, there's Pluto. They discovered stuff beyond that, so they kind of revised it. But as it stands, right, Saturn is the last of the visible planets, so you could say he's the last planet in the material realm, right? He's the, the Lord of, he's where the material realm stops, what we can perceive with our material bodies. And after that, we kind of have to start using advanced technology and, and those themes, you know, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, they start to become very spiritual, very metaphysical. They're no longer just about like our, our 3D experiences. So Saturn's kind of yeah. like the one who's like, hey, we're wrapping up this physical experience 
let's make sure you get everything right and he doesn't care you know if you were good or bad or you know those 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 words don't mean anything to him he's just like i see that you had this side of the experience let's make sure you have that side of the experience um so it's like you know when when people talk about like their their negative karma um bad karma that kind of thing it's like maybe let's just say challenging karma right because you know for example there are cards in here where it's like these people had karma with um you know treating partners very unfairly in the past and now their partners are going to treat them very unfairly right that's just something that happens um but we don't want to necessarily say oh this is bad karma right um it's just that you know you wanted to have the experience of treating someone unfairly in the past and you did and uh now you're you just you're getting the opposite right now you get to see what that feels like um so yeah so that's that's why saturn six right that's that's the number associated with it in this system and mm. it all goes back to that sense of balance and yeah just the the, the libra the, the scales just coming back to you know did you experience this side of it um or not um one last fun fact yeah. i always love to throw in there about saturn and the six is I don't know if you guys know this, but do you know about the hexagon on top of Saturn, the planet? Okay, so this is so. wild. This is freaking wild. This is where you start to be like, okay, come on, guys. How do we not already accept that this is a simulation or that this is like, that there's more <laughs> to like, quote unquote, reality than most people out there will still have you believe, right? Like more than you're taught at school, more than the politicians tell you about. So recently i think in the last five or ten years they had a new imaging like probe or whatever satellite something that took some really high quality images of the platter platter the p planet saturn right um <laughs> and they discovered there's some they don't understand what it is right because they aren't able to like go down and look at it but there's some mm -hmm. kind of weather system like a pattern of of meteorological phenomena at the top like the north pole of saturn and you can google it it's in the shape of a perfect hexagon like i'm not making oh. this shit up like it's a, it's a geometrical hexagon up there and they don't know what it is but like yeah so anyway oh. saturn and sixes um there's definitely yeah. yeah there's definitely a connection there um and when you so just to go back to the cards for a second you know when you pull a six in your timed spread right that would be different than being a six by birth but any of us could have a six in our timed spread at any point in time um it can be a very very different experience depending on where in your spread that is so if you have a six in a very auspicious time of year like a jupiter period right that's typically going to be what we would think of as like good karma coming around right like somebody owed you a debt suddenly somebody makes you an unexpected payment or somebody gives you a gift or somebody helps you out sure. um but if you have six in like a saturn period right or maybe a uranus period where things are unexpected um or a mars period when there might be some conflict um it can be it can be something really scary um some of the like you know scariest things that happen are because we pulled a six in like an inauspicious time period um this is one of my favorite anecdotes but the oj simpson trial right he the first round he came out with flying colors. It was ridiculous, right? It was like it was like a joke that he got out of this this accusation, this murder accusation, right? With clean hands, right? It was like, how did he do this? Well, he did that because he was in an auspicious time of year, and he had my card, which has one of the strongest um, legal powers in the deck, um, like to back him up in that time period. So literally, nobody could touch him legally during that first trial. His second trial. Um, which was, I think, for it was some kind of civil suit, right? Like not tax evasion, but it was something, you know, it was something the equivalent of tax evasion, like the way they got Al Capone. Um, he was in a Saturn period and he had a six in his Saturn period. Um, so that came back to him. I think it was a six of clubs. So I, I think it was honesty in words, you know, mm -hmm. um, sixes are responsibility too, right? We're talking about like Mars making the choice to either fight or not fight. There's some responsibility implied there, right? Um, I feel like Venus is there to teach Mars about responsibility on some level because Venus only yeah. makes that decision to turn to violence when she has to, but Mars still consistently makes the decision to turn to violence for no reason. Um, so there's some element of like, hey, we have to learn, right? We have to learn the right choices, responsibility, and that's what sixes are, right? So if you are a six, right, Lori's a six of clubs, um, they're going to have a very strong commitment to an understanding of responsibility. 
So for Lori, that's going to be a lot about honesty, right? It's the, the word. Um, yeah. For Michael, Six of Diamonds, it's more about values in general. So he has a very strong sense of like justice um, and like people um, like people who are, you know, being hurt, who um, are weaker and that kind of thing. Um, and also money, right? Like he's also very sensitive to like feeling like people ripped him off, um, like really sensitive. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it'll, it'll differ depending on the suit, but either, you know, no matter what the suit is, it's a sense of like, oh, this is the right thing to do. Um, and if that pops up in your time spread, it's like, you're going to be held to that one way or the other. Um, so it was up to you mm -hmm. what you want to do, but if you make the wrong choice, it'll, it will come back to, to get you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and thinking about Saturn too, and like just going back a little bit to what you were saying about how like Saturn is the last visible planet, Hellenistic astrology speaks on Saturn being the final planet. Um, but then the more modern astrological take was like, oh, wait, Neptune's here. Also, Uranus is here. Also, Pluto's here. And every time that's something. I also like love to think about with Saturn is like every time another planet was discovered, they would be like, oh, well, maybe this is the doom and gloom final planet mm. of death and Saturn, maybe you're off the hook. Right. Mm -hmm. And they kept like almost changing yeah. the implications and meaning of Saturn every time another planet was found or invented or I don't know, whatever you want to call it. And so they would just keep finding these other planets and then they would just be like, oh, well, Saturn can just be this now and we'll just give all these like implications to these signs or these planets or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, Saturn has like changed meaning also um, a couple times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot about yeah. interpretation in there. Sure, Yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah and venus venus also um is exalted in pisces and i think that's something too that like might be worth bringing up in this episode as well because pisces can be very dreamy um mm -hmm. so there's almost like the practicality of that like taurus energy and you know it's two domicile signs are both opposite mars <laughs> they're both opposite mars signs um with scorpio and aries um but then the exaltation being venus just adds this like incredibly like dream like state and i mean i personally have a pisces venus and <laughs> it's not always the most fun um but it's it's very good at like creating these fake stories and situations and everything in your head um that don't always make sense <laughs> whereas um yeah which is like Pisces is such a different energy like such a Jupiter energy as opposed to Libra and um and Taurus and it's also mutable so it just adds like a whole other um meaning to yeah and that well. makes me think about what I was talking about earlier with the really ancient Orphic orientation of Venus being yeah. and like love is everything and it infuses everything and connects everything. And like that's Pisces as well, right? Pisces is the ocean and right. Pisces is the all encompassing like oneness that wraps around all of us. And then if you tune into that too much, you get disconnected from the 3D like reality TM type world that we're in. Um, you know, that's another way that I can really understand the relationship between Venus and Saturn is that you need the structure of Saturn. You need the separation and boundaries and container that Saturn provides mm -hmm. to hold that love force that is Venus. And if we were all just like floating around in this like jello of love all the time, that wouldn't be the, you know, mm. physical experience that we are here to have right now. <laughs> and so that's yeah. where Saturn <laughs> helps us, you know, know where I end and you begin, right? So you're not having enmeshment. So you're yeah. not having too much of like, we are individuals. We are like, you know, Mars is the autonomous individual, like energy that goes through all of us. But then we're also mammals who want to be in relationship. We're also in this world where everything is intertwined and interconnected. 
Um, and so having that healthy balance of, you know, not too much Saturn, not like you don't want to be too cold and brittle mm-hmm. and separate. And then you don't want to have too much Venus where you don't know like what your own limits are. You're just like too yeah. overwhelmed with like love and connection. Like you need the right balance between those, which then goes back to yeah. Libra, right? And the necessity of right. that balance and that symmetry. Yeah. Well, and I, have- I, I also want to add a, um, the, there's this, uh, in a TikToker, oh my God, um, who I really like. She's a Hellenistic astrologer and I can probably dig up this video and send it to you. But I saw it last night and it kind of made me laugh because she was talking about, um, she made a whole video about Venus in situationships. Lila, mm-hmm. I think I sent it to yep. you. Yep. And she was talking about how people who end up in a lot of situationships might have a Venus that is not associated with their sun and moon, like the luminaries. Um, It might be a blind spot. And um, this was something that we've joked about a lot with my chart because I have my Pisces Venus like kind of sandwiched in between my Aries moon and my Aquarius sun. Um, And this whole video just kind of made me laugh. And I was like, well, yeah, like there is no structure with it. My sun and my moon, my life force, my my two luminaries are both like not really paying attention to Venus. And and Venus is only nine degrees away from my moon. So like they're not, they're technically conjunct, I guess, depending on how big of an orb you use. But it's, um that was just something that I was thinking about too, where it's like being able to use that Venus energy for whatever you want to use it for and then just like adding in the structure like when it isn't making aspect to your sun or moon or things like that like how do you have structure how do you create structure especially um like in my case having it in pisces or like anyone who has such a like it it's such a great placement people always point it out the first thing they see in my chart but i'm like she is just creating her own world all the time. Like, I don't think you should be jealous of her. <laughs> um, and yeah, like there there just is no structure. There's almost no ability to actually hone in on what um, like I personally, like what I actually want or what I actually need because of that placement sometimes. And I think I've seen that a lot in other people who have um, – venus placements that are similar pisces venus particularly um they also have had a hard time like honing in on like well what do i actually want because what i'm searching for isn't reality right it's this like dreamlike person who's going to be perfect all the time or going to do all these things but like there's no mundane in pisces like it's the ocean it's it's a dream it's a creation um and yeah yeah, well, it also makes me think about your cards, too, because you're a king of clubs, right? And that's such a, like, mm-hmm. authoritarian, um, analytical, you want to get all the information, you want to organize all the information, you want to make judgments based on the information and rule based on the information, right? But it's like a very, like, structured, like, mm-hmm. okay, this happens, this happens, this happens. Um, and it's very competent and it's, yeah, it's, it's very organized. But then you've got that, I mean, to use an astrology term, it's like in detriment, right? Your queen of hearts which is kind of that it's the double Neptune card, yeah. right? It's it's love and romance and all that stuff is your Pluto card. So it's almost like a blind spot or like a, like we're talking mm-hmm. about Pluto being the last planet at this point, right? As far as we know, but who knows what we'll find later, right? So it's almost like sure. that last frontier is almost like a black hole, right? Like whether it's Saturn or Pluto or right. whatever, it's like that's where human perception ends. So we're kind of like, okay, mm-hmm you know what's on the other side who knows so it's almost like your pluto placement is like a big question mark too um right (laughs) yeah there were a couple things i wanted to add um about the whole like pisces and neptune thing as well because um there may be something similar in astrology but one of the coolest um like laws or principles that i learned from this card system was um what's called the law of fives so it's basically just that like the planets Mm -hmm. that are like five slots apart right they have that connection so like neptune is just venus on a higher octave right um pluto is just mars on a higher octave um and there's no planet five slots above jupiter but in the card system we say like there's a cosmic reward that's like jupiter on a higher octave that kind of thing um so like the connection between um you know venus and neptune is that they're both about love 
but Venus is much more about earthly love or personal love. And Neptune is like you said, it's that all encompassing. Um, it's also like sacrificial because in order to get to that state of the dreamy love jello, right, that is Pisces, it's like you have to relinquish all sense of self, right? You're saying boundaries and Saturn and stuff. Right. And it's very interesting because, I mean, I'm a queen of hearts and I only have that one card, right? Most people have typically like two or three, sometimes even four cards um, as their baseline cards. Um, because I'm a first decanate sun sign Leo, who's also a court card, that's my gender that I associate with or that I identify with in real life. Like I only have one card. So I am just literally the queen of hearts, right? And she's the double Neptune card. She's in the Neptune row. She's in the Neptune column. Um, and it's all about, it's that, it's that love. It's that dreamy, you know, that dreamy quality. Um, but it's interesting because, I mean, tying in a little bit about the tarot too, right? The queen of cups is about self-care. So on some level, if you're a queen of hearts, there's this huge lesson about drawing boundaries and being like, where do I actually end? And where does this person next to me begin? Because your impulse as just yeah. a queen of hearts is just to give and just to merge with everything and everybody. And I've definitely had that experience, especially in younger years of just being like, oh, of course. But then of course there's consequences that come, right? When you don't draw those boundaries. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's, there's, there's definitely a really interesting connection there between like Venus versus yeah. Neptune. And like, as you get higher and higher in these like spiritual planes, right? And you, you go to Neptune, which is like a spiritual octave of Venus. It's like, yes, things are becoming more and more like exalted or more and more ethereal. But also there's this very real danger of losing yourself in a mundane sense. And like in the card system, right? Mm -hmm. If you have too many Neptune connections with someone, or if you have like a Neptune connection as your number one connection, um, that can be really challenging. Um, Michael and I, our first connection is a Neptune connection. And that can be really hard because he, I'm his Neptune, right? So on top of being this double Neptune card and only having one card, um, and on top of being his karma cousin that he's supposed to give something to, um, you know, I'm also this Neptune connection for him. So it's like, I think it can be hard yeah. for him sometimes to just see our relationship or see me clearly because there's just that that love jello is just threatening to you know take over well, and just yeah and neptune can absolutely put things on a pedestal too yes. just to yeah. like add that yeah, rose like, colored neptune. glasses as well yeah and absolutely like, right right like <laughs> yeah and it's like, like this is awesome <laughs> right and it's like it, you know it's like as the as the partner who is being perceived through the neptune lens it can be frustrating sometimes because mm -hmm. you're like i'm not that perfect i'm not this mm -hmm. person that yeah. you think i am you know like um, yeah. And it can make you, I guess, sort of feel bad about yourself, too, because you're like, I'm never going to be this person that you see me as, right? Because you're seeing me as like this exalted version of myself that doesn't exist. Um, but the positive of that is that there's this person there who just sees this most amazing version of you and like believes in it, right? Um, and can yeah. kind of help you. I mean, if it's a question of balance, but hopefully they can help you move in the direction of being that person, being more like that person in real life. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's always a plus and a minus, but it's definitely, it's like, I feel like the further out in the realms that you go, right? Like after Saturn, you're just like, you're starting to get into like just really weird territory. Like, like Uranus mm -hmm. is like just such a weird planet, right? Like anything is possible. And then Neptune, it's like you're losing all sense of self, like you're merging with like the universe. Um, and then, and, and like in the card system, right, Neptune, um, there's a lot of like nine energy there too of like just losing yourself, becoming one with the universe. All the nines are on the brink of like melting yeah. basically and, and giving up everything and, and just transforming. And then you're like, you reach Pluto and you're like, oh shit, you know what, <laughs> what now, right? Do we just start right. over? Or, yeah. Where, where do we even go at this Rebirth, point? Rebirth, well, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting too with you talking about the way that you and your husband's cards interact and it's making me think too of um, like Saturn and Sinistry and astrology and another way that that shows up with like Saturn and Venus's friendships mm -hmm. is that Saturn actually can be a really good Sinistry planet in astrology mm -hmm. like and that's yes. something that I learned from Kelly Surtees who is just an amazing at looking at Sinistry and astrology and I'll put her relationship astrology class in the comments because or in the show notes because like she's just so good at teaching how to look at relationships and how to look at how different charts and progressions and transits 
planets can interweave for that. But Saturn, like a lot of people are terrified of Saturn. You know, they're like, what's going to happen in my Saturn return, the Saturn transit, I'm going to lose things. I'm going to hear no a lot. Like there's going to be blocks and consequences and like that can all be true. But Saturn also brings structure and longevity and commitment. And so like people having Saturn moving through their seventh house, that could mean that you're getting married or that you're meeting a partner who you're going to be with for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas, you know, talking about Neptune, bringing in more that dreamy, fun, like rose colored loving glasses that you were talking about, Lilla. And it's like Saturn might make Mm -hmm. things a little more brittle or you have to be careful to not let them dry out too much. But it's just another Mm -hmm. way that Saturn and Venus work together, right, is that a Saturn transit or, you know, something going on with Saturn can actually bring really stable, long lasting relationships as well. Well, and let me just throw in there because this is something I think I mentioned to Lori last night, but it was, it's a perfect segue from what you said um, in the card system, right? When you calculate your connections with people, um, again, I don't want to make it too complicated, but there's um, sort of two tiers of connections. There's like what we call your direct connection, and then there's what we call your vertical connection. And this is all just based on um, what's called the grand solar spread. So it's the array of cards when you lay them out in their natural order. Um, and it's sort of like this is the the base pattern for like the universe, right? It's almost like if you had a natal chart for Mm -hmm. the universe, that's like the grand solar spread. And then you calculate people's connections Mm -hmm. based on like how many spaces apart they are basically. So like one space away is a Mercury connection, two spaces away is a Venus connection, et cetera. Um, So when you're looking at the vertical connections, um, there's a rule where like for most of the cards, not all of them, but most of them, anytime that someone is venus to you you're saturn to them like it's just math it's like this Mm -hmm. that's how the spaces count out um and that's kind of interesting because on the surface of it you'd think oh that might be that might be bad right because like there might be it might be sort of unbalanced or you know one person would be feeling the saturn connection the other one would be feeling the venus one but i feel like in practice you you don't really you don't really feel that so much um i feel like saturn Mm -hmm connections can actually be really pleasant um i think i was saying that to Lori too yesterday that like you know um i don't think we're Mm -hmm. necessarily attracted to our saturn connection in the way that we're attracted to um a pluto connection um or obviously like a venus connection a jupiter connection um but when you do have a saturn connection in your life um often they're actually pretty nice you know like it, it things work pretty well like sometimes they can be it's like if you're resisting a Saturn connection, I think it can be pretty hard. Um, but if you're kind of yeah. open to them, it can be actually really nice. And it's interesting because well, like it has that same quality almost as like a Venus connection of like ease. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think with Saturn too, to like kind of play into that, um, Saturn is like life lessons and difficulty and like it it does like handle a lot of those themes, but like if if you think about like a person right if you've never been through anything in your entire life like no hardships no nothing like just completely easy life everything's always been handed to you who do you become right like that's not a person I would want to hang out with like that doesn't sound like a fun person um whereas people who have been through hardships are typically the nicest people right like very poor people are more likely to give to others. And um, I just think there's a lot to be said about like, and that's why um, bringing it back to tarot, I talk about the star card all the time. The star is my favorite card in the whole world. It's the Aquarius card. It's Saturn. Like it's a Saturnian energy. And the thing that I love so much about the star is that it's the card that follows the tower and the tower is Mars. It is the card of like chaos and destruction. And like, um, and I actually, I had a reading a few days ago where I was talking about this. Um, but she just kept asking the same few questions over and over and the tower just kept coming out. And I was like, look, you can pull the Jenga blocks out of the tower and knock it down yourself and make it a controlled tower moment or you can sit here and look at it and wait for the universe to just come in and like knock it out for you right like very five of cups energy it's like if you don't take action if you don't create the tower the towers can happen anyway so would you rather have a tower moment 
that you choose, that you create, or would you rather have one that just happens to you? And then going into that star energy, the star is the hope and faith and renewal of the bad moment. It's like, yeah, that thing happened and it sucked and it was awful, but you can only see stars at night, right? Like you don't see the star in the daytime. And so there's something very beautiful about the darkness that comes in that. And I talk about that with the sun and the moon as well. Like the moon has such an anxiety feel to it, that card at least, um, which is Pisces, right? And I always joke like, hey, when the sun is out, you can see, right? There's nothing scary about whatever's happening 10 feet in front of you when the sun is out. But when the moon is out, you can't always see. And so the fear isn't necessarily like, something tangible but like the fear is the unknown the fear is the fact that it is dark and you don't know what's 10 feet in front of you and you don't know what you're walking into it's literally just a fear of not knowing and when you don't know it causes anxiety but you need a little bit of that darkness for the stars to even appear in the first place and I think people who have a lot of Saturn energy or like relationships that have a lot of Saturn energy Um, they're not always going to be easy, but they're going to make you a lot stronger and they are going to give you almost like a reason to stay together or a reason for you to become a better person. Um, and I have a lot of Saturn energy in my chart anyway. I attract a lot of Saturnian people. Um, but I just, I love Saturn energy. Saturn is one of my favorite planets because of that, because you know, you you need Saturn for longevity. People who are only like happy and good all the time, like they're not necessarily going to last. So like what happens when the tower moment does happen? Like you have no foundation. Also, I think yeah. Saturn, I feel like is teaching us about the value of surrender, because I think the thing about Saturn is right. that you can sure. fight Saturn all you want and you will never win. It's that six energy, right? Saturn isn't yeah. necessarily going to like seek you out. But as soon as you're slightly off your path, Saturn comes in and is like, oh, you're off your path. Let's nudge you back, you know. And there are these times in your life when mm-hmm. obviously Saturn returns and stuff that's going to be more obvious. But it's like it's almost just this energy of like you realize, wait, I'm fighting myself. Oh, shit, you know. Mm-hmm. And when you have that realization, you can actually kind of relax. And then it's like you get to tap into like this kind of like peaceful state of like this Venusian energy, right? Well, there's, I think like, Mm -hmm. you know, Saturn and Pluto are like two of the challenging planets or or connections that we think of, but Pluto has like a very different energy, right? It's not like, there's not necessarily like this peace on the other side. It's more just like a rebirth and like, oh, wow, like there's this too, cool. What am I going to do now? You know, Um, and it can be scary because there's like all this chaos and stuff happening, but like, I think it's like Pluto, you don't even get a choice to fight it. Like it just kind of happens. It just, you're just like, whoa, my mm-hmm. world is falling down. Um, whether Saturn, it's like, you can choose to fight. You can choose to fight as long as you want, but like, you're going to be exhausted. You're going to drain every single right. bit of life energy out of you by fighting if you keep fighting, right? Um, right. And usually sooner or later, somebody realizes, oh, I have to stop fighting. But if you don't stop, yeah. then I think, you know, that's when you start to get these situations like, manifesting chronic illnesses and and you know just like really right difficult things because it's like the body is like no we got to stop yeah Yeah. and um to add oh go ahead I think Saturn gets a really bad rap but I actually just really love her energy so just kind of coming in and backing what you guys are both saying like Saturn has rules has regulations she's very clear on what you're supposed to do like Saturn governs clarity and it's just like Mm -hmm. it doesn't always feel good you know, it is necessity, but mm-hmm. Saturn's energy can, like, I think it's a really great energy to work with. I'm also in my Saturn return right now, so I'm trying to just embrace it. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Saturn rewards the hard work is what I was mm-hmm. going to say. Like, yeah, exactly. and so I think that's right. Like, that's the important thing to remember at the end of the day. Like, you, you can fight all you want, but like, when you sit down put your head down and like actually do the work you get rewards like it it's pretty easy like if the work's not necessarily fun but you will receive the rewards and you will receive so much good from it and I don't remember where I got this statistic from but um I had read somewhere that 95% of people have died during a Saturn cycle 
of like the seven year cycles. And that was, I like, I need to go back through my books and like find where I originally read that. I read it like five years ago. And that has been like the statistic that stuck with me the most ever, because I was like, that makes so much sense. <laughs> like, you know, cause there's about a year to two every seven years where you are in a pretty intense Saturn cycle. And if you don't do the work, if you don't listen to it, like you're going to die. <laughs> like that, that's, you know, that's when Saturn hits and the other like 5% of people, you know, the, I think about the people who make it to like 105. And when they ask, like, those are my favorite interviews when people are like, what's your secret? And they're like, I don't know. I smoked my whole life and I ate burgers every day and I drink three Dr. Peppers a day. Like, it's like, they say the craziest, yeah. craziest yeah. things. And you're just like, well, the answer is stress. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, they just don't care. They, like, have given up. They've surrendered. And they're fully just doing whatever they want to. And so they're just getting rewarded for that. They're surrendering to the Saturn energy. And that's whenever I see those those energies or those interviews, I always – it's such an Aquarius energy to me. Like, that is such an Aquarius vibe. Like, I don't know. I just did whatever I felt like it, and then it just worked out. Yeah. Um, But, like – it is that that sense of surrender that makes so much sense to and those like people. not trying to resist or fight or control things that are outside of your control. Although your right. health is actually a, you have a lot of control over what sure. you eat and stuff, but Saturn does <laughs> <laughs> Saturn does govern all you know these things that are greater and heavier than us. You know, like we live in societies. There's court systems out there there's countries there's climate change mm -hmm. there's like things outside of us that we can't control and when you're trying to fight or resist it too much I think you can bring in a more difficult Saturn energy whereas when you're not resisting yeah. those bigger things it's, it's the resistance that's the issue um I yeah, also do a time resistance check. and stress yes exactly a hundred percent um but we're coming up on an hour and 45 minutes so I just want to like this is so fun yeah. to chat but maybe if we want to start wrapping up if we have any like final thoughts that we want to share before we kind of tune down um <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well I'll I feel like that's a really good place to end it just kind of saying that like you know when you resist things and you you stress that's when things tend to go wrong for people I mean I've worked in the fitness world for 12 years I've seen it a million times you can of course you should eat healthy and you should work out and like you should do those things but like stressing yourself out over your diet and stressing yourself out over the gym and like forcing those things into your life um is ultimately going to add more harm than good and mm. I think force I think is that's... a great word very key mm -hmm. word there because yeah it's like Forcing. it's that lesson that Venus doesn't force you know when she's forced she fights back right but Venus love right. cannot be forced you cannot force love it just is right um and you can nurture it and you right. can encourage it and all these things but mm -hmm. like it can't be forced and like Saturn yeah. is just like that that flip side to Venus that no one wants to see where it's like hey you can't force this stuff like just let it be and do your best and right. it'll be right. good. like go to the gym and yeah. have fun and eat the healthy foods because you like the healthy foods but like moderation you know if you feel like you need to drink a soda every day then like <laughs> counteract it with some fruit or eat a salad I don't know but like I'm not a dietitian, but it's just like finding moderation, finding those pieces where you're not like living day to day stressed out and miserable because you're forcing yourself to eat a certain diet or do the certain things, like have the certain schedule, like just surrendering to not fighting, just surrendering to that Venus energy, maybe even just understanding your Venus placement. Examining where there's resistance, yeah, would be the, the flip side to that, I think. Yeah, yeah. exactly, for sure. Because Venus is like almost like the lack of resistance, right? Like in this system, like when you have a Venus connection mm. with someone, it's like it's just ease. It's comfort. It's like, hey, we've done this mm. before and we like the same okay. things and we just we put each other at ease, right? 
you don't think about it because mm. it's so easy, right? You don't think about breathing. You don't think about smiling. It just happens. Um, but then when you start to mm. encounter the resistance, that's like the other side of it. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes we, we're chasing that ease, which cannot be chased or forced. And we're trying to squeeze it out of a situation, right? And we're like, oh, I think this will be great for us. So I'm going to force myself to eat healthier. I'm going to stalk this girl or whatever, you know, extreme examples. But yeah. like, I'm going to chase this thing that I think contains Venus energy. And it's like, you can't chase that, right? That's like the, right. such a basic, um, you know, saying like love will land in your lap when you're not looking for it, right? And it's not just romance. Right. It's it's love in general. It's, it's that feeling. It's acceptance. Yeah, yeah. And just like whatever is meant to be will be when it's meant to <laughs> and whatever timing is or, or whatever um in all in all ways in all areas of life and you know like fighting and fighting and fighting um like for a job or something it's like you know you can apply for the job but then just walk away you know like it's you yeah, yeah. it's definitely that like that difference and yeah, and I think just like expanding whatever, you know, observations you have about your own chart, your own Venus placement, your own um, experiences sure. with romance, expand that into the rest of your life, right? Yes, that's about your personal relationships and stuff. And that's obviously everyone's interested in that theme for good reason. But it's not yeah. Venus is not just about, you know, Valentine's Day and, and marriage. Yeah. It's right. So Venus is not relationships. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, sometimes, yeah. you know, sometimes it is. But and, you know, but it's it is. It's so much but in. That. In traditional astrology, too, Venus is a huge money indicator in mm -hmm. abundance, too. Abundance. So, like, yeah. and that's that's something Jeez. we didn't even get to today. Right. And maybe we can do another episode on that. But, yeah, like, how you attract money and how you can, like, create your dream job and stuff like that. Those are all Venus themes, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, Themes abundance. that are way less talked about. <laughs> Well, because Venus right, like, is yeah. the principle of attraction and mag yeah. and magnetism, right. you know, she's right. very, I didn't right. think about that too with my Venus Pluto, because Pluto is also very magnetic, you know, both of yeah. those planets are really mm -hmm. pulling in rather than putting, well, Pluto puts stuff out too, but Venus is very much about pulling mm. things in. Absolutely. That's yeah, and power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, this was really fun. This was just like we chatted about so many things. Um, and thank so you so much things. for Lila, Lila for coming <laughs> on. Uh, this is really one of the big things that Lori and I want to do with this podcast is connect all of these different mm -hmm. modalities with astrology. And so hearing about the love card system and all of the amazing like research and studying and experience that you've been putting into getting to know that system and connecting it to astrology and love and everything else that we talked about has been really, really fun to do with you today. Um, and then we usually just like to wrap up by sharing a little bit about like what we have going on, what are some offerings or things that we have right now. And so if you just want to share kind of how people can stay in touch with you. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I can give you guys like my website to post on your, you have like a blurb or whatever for the, mm -hmm. for the episode. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just a little sparrowsnest.com. That's just my website right now. And yeah, I'm doing readings, um, doing a lot of stuff, definitely a little bit all over the place, but this is one of my favorite things to do. So I'm always open to, um, do readings and also just chat and connect with people who are interested in this topic. Cause again, I feel like there's not as many people out there yet who know about this system. So yeah, just looking to network and keep expanding. And I've gotten a reading from Lila and it's really fun. It's like so much cool, fun information. It's cool to see the ways it intersects with astrology and the ways that it's different. And so I would highly encourage people to reach out to Lila because this system, the love card system provides like a new nuances and new angles to things. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really nice to kind of see what the cards have to say. Yeah, I, I think it pairs yeah. really well with astrology because I'm not an astrologer, but I know, you know, bits and pieces and I'm lucky enough to have friends like you guys. So I'm always getting these astrology tidbits and I'm like, oh, wow, that fits in perfectly mm -hmm. with this. So, yeah, very complimentary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And me and Lilla also right now are offering a little bit of a Valentine's package. Um, <laughs> yes. Not so yet. there's three different packages. Yeah. And they are... They're on my Instagram. I can pin it so you can read about them so we don't spend another 20 minutes talking about each one. Um, but a lot of them are more like sinistry or self-love paired. So um, 
you're going to get a 30 minute recording from Lila and a 30 minute recording from me um, about astrology and about the cards, um, basically very similar things as a package deal, or you can get it as a um, virtual like reading with both of us as well. That'll be an hour and a half. Um, so there's two different ways you can order those and you can shoot either one of us a message if you want to get one of those or work with us. Um, we didn't really put an end date on when we're offering that till, but since we're posting this on Valentine's Day, I'm happy to keep offering it. Yeah. Yeah. For, I, mean, I yeah, love doing couples for whenever. <laughs> and yeah. And like yeah. all this stuff about compatibility, um, and also just looking in your own chart to see where that abundance lies, where those kind of good yeah. vibes lie. Yeah. Yeah. So if you hear the podcast episode and it's like three months into the future and you still want one, feel free to reach out. We'll we'll do it anyway. <laughs> it was a Valentine's deal, but that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're we're a deal for listening to the podcast. Thank you for making yeah. it this far. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If you've made it this far, we'll make you a reading. Um <laughs> maybe you'll get a discount too. Um, and also Lila was the one who edited and helped me so much with my breadcrumbs book as well. So I just yeah, love to point really that out. Project. Yeah, that was a really fun project. So if anyone looks into the book or has read it, um, Lila had a huge impact on that too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and right now for me, what I have going on is not a lot because I'm just like skiing and frolicking in the woods and using the winter to rest. But one thing that I think is relevant, especially to what we were just talking about with health, is to just remind folks that I am an herbalist. I have over 600 hours of training in um, Western herbalism. And so if you are interested, if you do have any sort of issues that you want just an herbal perspective on. I am not a doctor. I do not like diagnose or treat, but I will provide, you know, inside of what the plants, you know, what um, herbalism can help out with, what different lifestyle practices can help with. My feel like my orientation is really how do we work with the body's vital life force and support the body to get to a place of more balance and well-being in our bodies and, you know, feeling safe and empowered to take care of ourselves. And so, um, yeah, if you want to talk about any health issues and get an herbal perspective on them, my Instagram will be down in the show notes and my website as well. And you can definitely reach out to me and I don't have a formal reading, like a formal offering for herbal consultations yet, but I would love to, you know, either do trades or any sort of offering with folks who are interested. So yeah, just a reminder that I am an herbalist, um, as well as an astrologer. And yeah, and Alicia's readings are cool because she mingles both of them too. So I feel like mm -hmm. all of us do a little bit of all these things, but it's definitely, I love yeah. getting not just one modality, but like multiple perspectives and seeing, like, it's just confirmation, you know, that like mm -hmm. it's it's true, you know, it's coming. From and they somewhere. just mm -hmm. support each other so well, like the when yeah. you mix different modalities yeah. together. Yeah. And also we have an Instagram now conversations. Mm -hmm. um, with planets um it's just a w and um we'll we'll post a little bio blurb of lila and how to reach her too so as always if you want to reach out to any of us if you have questions if you want to contact any of three of us for readings um or if there's anything you want to see on the podcast or if you just want to like say hi um we did just make an instagram so feel free to reach out and lila will be linked on there as well yay awesome well, thanks everyone <laughs> for listening and we will talk to everyone soon bye